Hello, hello everybody. Today's date is April 8th, 2021, and here we are for another movie collection update. VHS, DVD, Blu-ray, we got it all. As per usual, I've got a very interesting selection of things here. It seems like each update I just keep outdoing myself with the amount of random, crazy movies that I just happen to be getting. So without further ado, here we go. Got two VHS tapes this time around. As you guys who follow these updates know, I love my random, silly VHS tapes. And uh, today's pick I got at a thrift store. It's fitting that they had this there. This was the only one they had. And Virgo, your personal astrological guide to love, money, and fitness. It's fitting that it's a Virgo because A, this is the only sign they had there. And I am a Virgo. My birthday is September 1st, so it's perfect. So I watched this tape to be enlightened by Sidney Omar, and what I was delighted to was a guy who just sounded like he was talking off the top of his head with some very airy, spacey music, and seeing Sidney Omar propped up against some hysterical green screen effects. 85 is when this was made, and it shows. It shows, so yeah. That was interesting. No offense if you follow the astrological signs, if that's your thing. Good. I'm proud of you. It's just that that tape was a little strange. And uh, speaking of strange, I was very happy to get this one. As you know, every update I have to have a Gary Busey movie in the update because I love nothing more than just Gary Busey being Gary Busey. And this is a film that was only released on VHS, never got to DVD or Blu-ray yet. Maybe that will change one day, who knows. But this one is The Chain from 1996. Now let me tell you, when you want to see a movie that opens with Gary Busey and another guy doing an undercover sting operation in a hotel, dressed fully head to toe in makeup as clowns, for zero reason whatsoever. Like, this hotel is deserted. There's no party. There's no carnival. There's no nothing. Just for some reason, they're doing a stakeout in this hotel dressed head to toe as clowns. When that's your opening scene, you know exactly what you're in for. It's like a, uh, it's like a prison movie with, uh, where they're in the, you know, this South Central American, South American country. And, uh, Gary Busey and this other guy who he's been hunting all of these years. He finally gets them, but then they both get thrown into this prison, and it becomes like a, almost like a cool hand Luke, great escape type thing where they're chained together at the wrist, and they gotta put aside their differences to work together. But if you wanna see Gary Busey being Gary Busey, this'll give it to you. Like there's so many, there's a part near the end where he becomes a chic, and he's a miracle healer, he saves a little kid's life. Like, if you want some B-movie madness, Gary Busey being Gary Busey, the chain. Alright, moving on to the Blu-rays, we've got Joshua Tree with Dolph Lundgren and the late George Seagal, who has just passed away a few days ago, you know, per me recording this, so this is for you, Joe. I actually bought this, and I watched it the day before he passed away. So that just makes this a little bit even more strange. But it's a good movie, you know, also known as Army of One. Uh, it's more of a road thriller movie than it is an all-out action. But when the action's here, it's fantastic. Like, the whole scene in the garage with all the cars is awesome. That's a wonderful scene. I guess there's two different versions. The, the DVD version, Army of One, has an extended fight at the end, which is here in the special features. I don't know why they couldn't have just left that in the whole cut of the movie. That's a little strange. But no, Dolph is great. Even though his character is really weird and he's unlikable through the majority of the thing, I'm like, this is supposed to be our hero? But then by the time you really get into it, like I said, the garage scene, that alone is just awesome. George Seagal does great. Jeffrey Lewis is in there. So yeah, I like this one, Joshua Tree. It's kind of a weird thing to name the movie after. I, I know where it comes from in the title and the scene, but I don't know. I, but even Army of One, that doesn't really, that makes it sound more like an action movie. 
Yeah, no. Hard movie to title. There we go. Joshua Tree, fun thriller. I'm going to get a lot of hate for this because you guys know me. I love the 80s. I love the 80s soundtracks. I love the 80s movies. I love the 80s vibes. And this is like the definitive 80s movie. I've never been a big fan. I love the soundtrack. But as far as the film itself, I've never been as into rad. I know Vinegar Syndrome put out that Blu-ray that's loaded with tons of special features and stuff that this doesn't have. But if you want to pay 200 bucks for it, that's fine. I like this packaging better. I think the steel book just looks cooler. And I'm not a big enough fan of rad where I really need the special edition. Yeah, I, like it's a pretty droll movie if you're not a fan of BMX biking. I've never really, I've never really cared much about that sport. So it's entertaining. The school dance scene is absolutely hilarious. Like, I seriously, the, the, that scene will have you laughing. But yes, it is so '80s. It's so rad. But I never got into the hype of this one like many other '80s people. You know, it's got a great soundtrack, but odds are, if you know me, if you're watching this, you've probably already seen Rad to make up your mind, so I, I've never gotten as into this as others. Now this one, on the other hand, this was a complete blind by never watched a trailer. I don't watch trailers. Pretty much every movie, when I buy it, and if I've never heard of it before, I go in blind. I don't watch trailers. I don't look stuff up. I like going in blind. And, you know, throughout the past year I saw, last summer I saw Phone Booth with Colin Farrell, had to do it a sniper, really loved it. Saw it earlier this year in January, Grand Piano with Elijah Wood, John Cusack, Alex Winter. Another great movie, very similar format with the Sniper, really liked it. So I bought this blindly solely based on the knowledge it had to do with a Sniper again. And it's a British film from 2012 called Tower Block. And I gotta tell you, out of everything in this update, this might be the number one movie of this entire thing. I absolutely love it. Get a good look at it there, so make sure you pick this up. This is a Shower Factory Blu-ray. This was excellent. Very, very, very rarely do I watch a movie that has me legitimately on the edge of my seat, in suspense, wondering what's gonna happen next, how is this gonna go, I gotta see how this ends. Very, very, very rarely do I get that intrigued by a movie, and this was just excellent. I, obviously, it's a British film, it's all British actors, so I didn't recognize anybody, but they all do fantastic. The character, and you think you know what's going to happen. I remember I sat down, I started watching this, and you think, you're like, oh, okay, well, there's no way that character is going to get killed. Oh, yeah, there's our fine, there's our lead, there's our... No, this movie will take... Every presumption that you have, everything you think will know will happen, and it turns it all on its head. You know, your expectations are out the window for this, and that's another reason why I love it. So it's dreary, it's suspenseful, it's atmospheric, and yeah, this is underrated. The fact this does not have a bigger cult following in the U.S. I think is a shame. Because seeing this in the theater, I think, would have been a trip. Like, I'm sitting here on this couch watching it on my TV, and I'm on the edge of my seat. So seeing this in a theater, I can only imagine what that must have been like. So, you know, some parts of it are very shocking. Not what you expect, but it's awesome. And this might be my favorite thing out of this entire update. So, yeah. Tower Block, if you like thrillers, almost borderlining on horror. Or if you like Phone Booth, Grand Piano, the Sniper movies... This, I like this the best out of all three of them. I would put this above Phone Booth and Grand Piano. And I really enjoyed both of those, but this this was outstanding. I cannot recommend this highly enough. Check it check it out. That's, that's all I can say. I don't want to spoil anything. And then this is a special edition Blu-ray set that came out towards the end of last year. Finally got around to picking it up. Wasn't sure if I was going to or not, but... I've been working a shit ton. Guys, I've got a full-time job, I've got a part-time job, and I've got like three different side projects that I do, so I was like, I'm treating myself to this. And it's the Aero Video Tremors set, which comes with, I won't take it all out, but it comes with a book, the inside of the Blu-ray's got all these little lobby cards and postcards and photos and little, you know, 
Chang's grocery store coupon. And, like everything you see on the back there, that is all special features. So if you're a fan of Tremors, like I am, Tremors 1 and 2 are fantastic. Anything after 2, I can take or leave. Like 5 was terrible. 6 wasn't that good. 7 was at least watchable, though I think everyone knows about the ending of 7 by now, Shrieker Island. But, you know, Tremors is a classic with Kevin Bacon, and they got him interviewed on this too, which surprised the hell out of me that they got Kevin Bacon to talk about this. So yeah, he sits down, you know, all the makers, and, you know, Tremors is a unique, I wouldn't call it a horror, full-fledged horror movie. It, you know, it, it's definitely light-hearted, a light-hearted monster movie. It, it, you know, it goes in the great kind of category of things like Gremlins, or, you know, in that area where it's light-hearted horror <coughs> but no, then you know it got its it got its justice with this set. This is a fantastic special edition from Arrow. So yeah, great set. Whew. I talk so much when I do these. Now this is another one. I'm very happy to finally see this get a Blu-ray release. I had to import this all the way from Australia. It's by an Australian uh, studio called Imprint, but it's an all-region Blu-ray, so you don't have to worry about region coding. Another fantastic thriller that really keeps you watching, keeps you guessing. Breakdown with Kurt Russell. I don't think this needs too much introduction. They've got, you know, interview audio it's not video they got audio interviews on here with the director the stunt coordinator the assistant composer one of the actors and it, the director interview was cool too because he goes in and they show some still images of this original 15 minute opening sequence from this that was cut where you find out Kurt Russell's character is a cameraman and he's in the Bosnian war and he witnesses a murder and it was this whole crazy opening and ultimately it got cut. I think for the best because the movie flows perfectly with what they ended up with. But like I said, I've been sitting on an old Paramount DVD of this for years and it didn't have anything for features on it. So to see this finally get a good Blu-ray transfer with some extras on there to keep the fans happy, very happy breakdown guy. And like I said, it's all region, pretty affordable price too. So if you want to get it, you know, it's an Australian import, but it's worth it. The Sure Thing with John Cusack, continuing my John Cusack realm of 80s comedies. You know, Better Off Dead is my number one favorite movie of all time. I stand by that, and I've been saying that for many, many years now. I like One Crazy Summer, but a couple months ago, it was right after Christmas, I saw a movie he did in the 80s called Hot Pursuit that I thought was absolutely terrible. But this one was fun, the sure thing. You know, it's not as memorable as Better Off Dead, One Crazy Summer, or some of, you know, John Cusack's later movies. But it's fun for what it is. They got lots of nice, you know, features on there, directed by Rob Reiner. They got uh, audio commentary, three mini featurettes on the making of, you know. So, again, they gave this one <laughs> lots of credit, too. But, no, this one's fun. I think especially, I know some people aren't a fan of this one that I talked to, but I liked it. I think for me, too, coming off of Hot Pursuit, which I thought was terrible, like, this one was fun. So, you know, for your 80s comedy, you know, again, it's a road-type movie, but, you know, it stays fun enough. Tim Robbins has a fun little appearance in there. This one I snagged because I saw it went out of print. Like, out of nowhere, went out of print, now it's going for all this money, so, and I had the opportunity to buy it for like seven bucks, I was like, oh, shit, I better grab that. Oh God, directed by Carl Reiner, and I like this one. I know it has two sequels, from what I understand, neither of them are very good, they're retreads on this, but, I mean, George Burns is back in all of them, which is nice, but this was fine. So George Burns and John Denver, which it was funny seeing him as the lead, he actually does pretty good here, too. He fits the film really nicely. You know, this is a light-hearted movie. You know, it's not too... If you think it's going to be preachy about religion and all that kind of stuff, thankfully, no, that is not what this is at all. It's a very light-hearted comedy. Some of it is actually pretty funny. This movie got some legit laughter out of me. 
Some of the effects are cheesy, but it's from 1977, so I don't know what you expect. Like, there's some scenes, there's a scene at the end in the courtroom. Some of the effects there, you know, not dated well at all. But I like this one. It's very uplifting. It's, you know, very, you know, life-honoring. It's a movie that has a very nice positive message to it. You know, I liked it. You know, this was pretty solid. It's a feel-good movie. So yeah, if you like your old classic 70s comedies with, you know, unique, quirky twists to it, I liked Oh God. The sequels, I don't know if I will see or not. <laughs> we just gotta play it by ear. Now this one I've heard a lot of good things about. This has a lot of praise online. I'm probably gonna divide more people here with this. I hated this. <laughs> Like I, like I said, I've been talking about some road movies, and I thought that's what this was. I looked at the cover, I read the synopsis on the back. I was like, ooh, this sounds fun. Freeway, with Kiefer Sutherland and Reese Witherspoon. I thought this was a pile of shit. <laughs> it, it's, it's a really strange modern retelling of Little Red Riding Hood, which, based alone from the opening credits, I was like, okay... This is different. I know many people have praised this as Reese Witherspoon's best acting role ever. I'm sorry, I thought she was annoying as shit in this. You have a bunch of unlikable characters doing illegal shit through the whole movie, and I, I thought this sucked. Like it wasn't, it wasn't goofy enough to the point where I was just laughing at it, but at the same time, it's still kind of twisted and it doesn't know what it wants to be and breaks the realms of reality like ten times over, especially with what happens with Kiefer Sutherland's character. There's a part near the end with Kiefer Sutherland that is so over the top with how gruesome and disturbing it is. I did kind of laugh because by that point he's got this robotic voice and everything, so I'm like, I don't know what the hell this movie's trying to do. It's, yeah, this is what, I love my weird, stupid B-movies, but this, I, got, and I thought this movie sucked. <laughs> like, I did not get into this at all. I'm sorry, guys. And this one I bought from one of my local used places. I saw this one sitting there. I, it's a double feature. Why these two movies are in a double feature together, God only knows. I <laughs> don't know. But I mainly bought it for the second one. So the first movie is a William Shatner, Hal Holbrook movie called Kidnapping of the President. It's boring. It's a political thriller. Nothing happened. Boring. The reason I bought this was for Death Row Game Show. Again, I don't know what the hell, <laughs> why they're on a set together, but I've been curious about Death Row Game Show for quite a while. I know people have talked about it. I've always heard of it. I've always seen the poster. I know it has a Blu-ray release, but I saw this DVD sitting there. I'm like, okay, four bucks. I got to pick this up. Death Row Game Show, um, it's the running man if it was written by the Zucker Brothers, you know, behind Airplane. If you took the cast and crew behind Airplane and said, make a version of The Running Man, which even came out the same year, that's what Death Row Game Show is. And when Death Row Game Show is in its silliest, most energetic moments, it's really fun. It's really stupid. It's really zany, screwball comedy. Not horror. And I saw some horror sites listing it. No, it is a complete screwball comedy. Don't even listen to anything that says it's horror. And... But the only thing is, there are definitely some pacing issues. Like, there are some parts where it focuses on the story revolving the host and his ties with the mafia. That stuff takes a little long. I, it didn't need to really dwell on that as much, because when the, you know, the game show aspect is where it's at the most energetic, the funniest, and just the goof, or just little gags, like the guy rolls his window up of his convertible, and the window as it rolls up, it says, fuck you on it. You know, it's silly stuff like that, so it's not perfect. If they would have tightened up the pacing just maybe a little bit, I think it could have been a great cult masterpiece. It's not perfect. It could use some edits, some cuts, some rewrites to tighten up the pacing. But overall, I enjoyed it. I was sitting there. It's my style of humor. It was very funny. There's a character in there. 
he witnesses something on a monitor that he shouldn't be witnessing, and his facial reaction of it, <laughs> the dumbest stuff in it made me laugh. So, Death Row Game Show, you have to have the right dark sense of humor for it, but if you do, there's a lot there to like. You know, you just got to get past some slow spots, and then you'll be good to go. Now, I don't even know where to begin with this one. <laughs> Again, this is another one of the ones where I go out shopping to my used places. You know, you can buy so many DVDs for a dollar, two dollars. This is another one I was browsing through the section they had of horror movies. I saw this one sitting there, and it was a complete blind purchase. I just, I kind of glanced at the cover, just kind of glanced at the synopsis on the back. I'm like, all right, let's give this one a shot. This might be all right. It's a movie from 2000 called Christina's House. I, I don't know what the hell they were trying to do with this. This thing, it's a terrible movie, but it's terrible in all the best ways in the sense that it's... I was still very captivated by this movie with how just weird and bad it was. I was laughing a lot. This is a film that the storyline that it tells is completely illogical nonsensical, and in some places completely non sequitur. There's no order. The movie continually just kind of pulls stuff out of its ass when it's convenient for the story, which the story in itself jumps around quite a bit between being like, okay, is this a supernatural thing, or is this, you know, is there a killer? Or then there's like some of this high school drama with the characters, but... By the time you hit the third act of this, it completely flies off the rails. There's like a double twist ending that, like the first twist, when you get right to the third act, does not make any sense whatsoever. It's completely illogical, but it's like, okay, well, <laughs> I've come along for the ride this far. I might as well keep going. And then you have like a second twist at the very, very ending that completely negates most of the movie beforehand and it makes absolutely nothing make sense. Like the opening scene of this has absolutely zero correlation to anything that happens. Yeah, this is a strange one. It, it's not good at all, but at the same time I was kind of captivated with just how mind-blowing it was. And by the time I got to the third act, I was literally sitting there I'm like, what the hell is happening? So yeah, it, it jumps all over the place. It's not good, but if you like your B-movie craziness, there, there's a lot of riffage to be done with this. And just the characters, you have the, the st overly obsessed boyfriend who continually just appears out of nowhere. Or this, the lead girl. I put this in the category of things, it's like, it feels like an R-rated Goosebumps Episode, let me tell you, the acting in this thing is definitely on par with acting you would see in a Goosebumps episode. So yeah, Christina's House. I don't know how many, how widely known that is, but yeah, that was, uh, yeah, I don't even know how to begin talking about that one, so. Not quite like anything I had seen before. Now this one, on the other hand, is a breath of fresh air. We've got Live and Let Die. You know, as you've seen in these past couple updates, I'm slowly going through all the James Bond movies. And I watched this one to commemorate the death of Yafet Kodo, unfortunately, rest in peace, who is also in The Running Man. You know, I was talking about Running Man with Death Row Game Show. And here we have, of the Bond movies I've watched so far, so far, you know, and, you know, not too far into them yet, but of the ones I've seen, this actually might be my favorite. Just because this has had the most action in it, this has had the zaniest storyline, it's had the coolest characters, Live and Let Die. And of course, who doesn't remember the song, Paul McCartney and Wings? Dun dun dun! Dun dun! Dun dun dun! Dun dun! I love it. I had a ball with it. I love Roger Moore. You know, I, I'm almost tempted to say while Sean Connery is, you know, a very definitive Bond with his image, I'm almost tempted to say Roger Moore has my favorite movies, just because the Roger Moore era of Bond is most definitely campier 
Like for in the last update, I showed Moonraker, so <laughs> there you go, right there. But no, this one was great. You know, Yafet Koto does great. Jeffrey Holder does great as this skeletal, you know, the man who can't die. And one of my favorite characters, too, is the guy that has the claw hand. He's in this one. He's a blaze, he's just smiling the whole time. The guy with the claw, love him. Yeah. Of the Bond movies I've watched so far, this might be my favorite one so far. So I really love Live and Let Die. Great time. This is another one I bought solely on the fact that I saw it was out of print and I got the opportunity to get it cheap just for a few bucks. So I was like, well, I better gobble that up. And I, I heard good things about this one. Hardware. Yeah. This is another one where I might divide a lot of people. I like this one. The third act when the robot goes crazy, you know, and he just starts killing the people is really well done. I really like the third act. It's like short circuit gone berserk. And a really cool set design, cool lighting, cool atmosphere. The, the, it's a very red movie, I'll say that. But it does a good job building the world. My main issue with this is that it takes a long time to get going. It's about an hour into the film before any of the action really starts taking place. So it's like, uh, I just wish, I mean, you've got some funny rock and roll. You've got Iggy Pop cameoing as a radio DJ. You don't see him, you only hear his voice on the radio. He's a DJ. Hey, everybody. Yeah, he does good. And you have Lemmy Kilmeister from Motorhead as a water taxi driver, which is funny. The third act is good. The first hour was just a little slow burn for my taste. And sometimes that could work. A movie I'm about to talk about here in a, in a minute it is very slow burn, but I liked it. But this one, I just wish it got to the point quicker. You know, that's the main thing I'll say about Hardcore. Not a bad movie, though. And keep in mind, in general, I'm just not a post-apocalyptic guy. I, I don't like period pieces. You know, I, I like movies that are set, you know, when they're made. You know, I know I probably sound basic as hell in saying that. And I've got two Paul Walker movies here for the Paul Walker collection. One is Ours. I actually saw this years ago uh, when I got my wisdom teeth pulled out. There was a day I was couch bound just watching a bunch of movies on demand. And this was on there and I watched it. And this, you know, Paul Walker is one of my favorite people. I'm a huge Fast and Furious fan, but I'm a Paul Walker fan in general. And every update I've tried to have a Gary Busey movie and I've tried to have a Paul Walker movie. And this time I got two Paul Walker movies, so there we go. You know, this is a slow burn, but it's done right, because this movie is dreary, it is dark, it is sad, it is depressing, but it is an emotional roller coaster ride. You really get to see Paul Walker's acting chops unlike you ever have before, and by the time you get to the ending, it's, you know, it's really heartwarming. You know, there's a lot of drama, and when there's the more tense thriller moments, this is a captivating movie. You feel like you're completely lost because the movie just entirely centers around Paul Walker's character. There's no one else. So you're seeing everything from his eyes in this. And so you feel that same sense of hopelessness that he feels throughout there. And it really pulls you into the world and just makes you feel miserable, but in a good way because it's really rewarding to follow the journey of Paul Walker's character. Even though it's a sad movie, it's very underrated, and if Paul didn't pass away, I who knows what other acting chops he would have gone on to, because his performance in this is fantastic. So if you can deal with a more dramatic, intense film, especially for following, if you're a fan of Paul Walker, definitely give this a go, because you'll see him in a new light than you've ever seen before. I mean, same thing with this other one. I know this one's got kind of very mixed reviews. I watched it with my dad, and we both really liked it. You know, again, it's a slow burn. It's a story-driven mystery. It's a very, it's more of a psychological drama than it is anything else. But we were captivated by the story, and we really wanted to see what happened next. And it's this movie called The Lazarus Project. I thought it was really well done. Again, you get to see Paul Walker acting in a way that you're not used to seeing Paul Walker, a more dramatic, more emotional role. 
for him. And, the, you know, it's a good psychological, like, you don't know what the hell's happening, there's some twists along the way, and I've heard two different interpretations of the ending of this movie. So I know there's one interpretation that's really happy, and one that is absolutely depressing. So, however, it's a very ambiguous movie in that regard, where some things are still left open by the end, but you still find enough out to where you can make your own conclusions for it. A lot of, you know, I'm not expecting you to automatically like this one, but I did. You know, if you can deal with a slow burn, mystery, psychological drama, give this one a go. And again, to see Paul Walker in a really nice acting role, to be a little bit more expressive than, you know, his usual action movie fare. All right, guys, we're almost done. I think we're making good time here. Sneakers. This was a cool caper movie with Robert Redford, Dan Aykroyd, Sidney Poitier, uh, River Phoenix. This is fun. They're like computer. I, I bought this on the basis of them being, uh, you know, they're computer hackers. They're, you know, heists and capers. And that's why I like this. It's a nice little caper movie. You know, the, this really fun cast of leads. They work really well together. It's a long movie. It breaks the two hour so again, there's some pacing where I think this easily could have been trimmed a little bit. But that aside, this one was fun. I like this one. There's a commentary making of. I haven't gotten any of the features on this one yet. But no, this one was fun. You know, I like sneakers. Just it could have been trimmed a little bit, but other than that, good time. Now, as many of you may know, I spent many years working at Sears. Three years, as a matter of fact, and I've got endless stories. And I still, to this day, plan on writing a book one of these days on just the crazy shit that happened when I was working at Sears. And since I started working there in 2015, which is the same year this premiered, I've had countless people tell me or ask me, like, Ken, have you seen Superstore yet? Oh, you got to see Superstore. Have you seen Superstore? Well, I finally got around to seeing Superstore because I was in my store. They had season one and season two, bought them both. I've gotten through both of these seasons, and you know this season one's only 11 episodes, uh, but this one is uh, 22. So, and I gotta tell you, you know, I haven't seen anything beyond the first two seasons. Season two ends on one hell of a cliffhanger, <laughs> so I, I'll be very, very interested to see how season three goes. Although one weird point with that, the cliffhanger that season one ends on. They must have aired season two out of order because season two, episode two, is the one that follows up this. So it's like the season two premiere kind of interrupts the continuity, which is weird. But the cast, you know, the cast works. You got America Ferreira, which I don't know too much about. I know my mom used to be a big Ugly Betty fan. I never really watched it. I like her character in this. You know, it's fun, and I know a lot of people criticize this of being just like The Office. Let me let you in on a little secret. I've never seen The Office. I've never really been a fan. You know, the clips I've seen are funny. I just never got into The Office. Sorry to say, I probably lost a bunch of subscribers there. But, and especially someone who's worked in a retail environment, you know, a lot of the jokes and a lot of the scenarios here are actually pretty funny. And some of like the cutaways they do where it's just like a four second shot of some random ludicrous thing happening in the store. It, I got I got this one. You know, it's not the best show ever. I'm not calling this one of my favorites. But I got through the entire first two seasons and I enjoyed it. So, you know, I'll definitely be looking for season three here soon too, because I'll be curious to see how they follow it up after that. I like and then Anybody watching, if anyone watching knows what my shirt is referencing, you know what this last one is. This is seasons one through nine of the Trailer Park Boys. One of my all-time favorite shows, one of my all-time favorite movie series. I saw the Trailer Park Boys live show a couple of years ago. I did the meet and greet with them afterwards. And I even ran into Julian in an airport in the Dominican Republic. So I've met Julian twice. <laughs> I met the boys. Unfortunately, it was after John Dunsworth. Mr. Leahy passed away, so I didn't get to meet him. But I did get to meet Randy, so I got to take a look at that stomach. 
And if you know Green Bastard, Parts Unknown is a very famous episode from season four. There's t currently 12 seasons, as well as two animated series, which those aren't that good. And uh, on their SwearNet app, which I do subscribe to, they have a new season. I don't know if you'd call it the 13th season or not, but it's called Trailer Park Boys Jail. And that one was pretty fun. I enjoyed that one. But the first nine seasons, you know, the first two seasons, you know, very raw, still finding their footing. But as soon as you get to, like, season four. I think season four is when it really picks up and gets good. Like, you got the Green Bastard episode, you got the Conky episode, you got the one where they're trying to run the makeshift spas out of the motel, and, you know, the shit hawks. The shit winds are a-blowing, Rich Richard. You know, oh, I love the Trailer Park Boys. It's not for everyone. If it's not your style of humor, I completely understand. I'm not expecting this to click with everyone. But I love the boys, you know. I've been watching them since the seventh grade. I know I was watching Trailer Park Boys. I was a fan of them long before Netflix ever bought them. I've been a fan since 2010. So I, I was an American who was a fan of this show, which is Canadian, before it was ever cool. So I'm definitely, seasons 10 through 12, I'm definitely going to start picking those up on DVD. But it was nice to get the first nine in this, you know, this potato chip, you know, design. So one of my favorite shows. I love Trailer Park. Well, that concludes my update for April 8th, 2021. Hope you all enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments what you think of my opinions. Uh, another weird selection of movies. We had some real winners, some real clunkers, and some movies that I just flat out don't know how the hell to describe. So, thank you for watching, everybody. It's been a very busy time period for me. I've got lots of amazing things coming up. Uh, look for more videos soon on me plugging these various projects that I'm involved in. Because lots of cool stuff is coming up. It's been a very productive period of time for me. And, uh, yeah, I look forward to getting all the news out to you guys soon. So stay tuned. Thank you for watching, everyone. All right. 37 minutes.